Well, it is 5.01, so we will call the meeting of the Deerfield School Committee to order for Tuesday, May 11th. Um, I should note that this meeting is being recorded. I've, now that I've gotten, Darius has gotten it going, <laughs> um, but this is a virtual meeting and it is being recorded for posterity. So um, the first order of business after the call to order is to welcome Erica Jacob and congratulations on your election to the Deerfield School Committee. <clears throat> so we're, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm very pleased to have you join us and I uh, hope you enjoy it as much as all of us do. So <laughs> um, sorry. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda would be a presentation by the um, Special Education Parent Advisory Committee for Union 38 Frontier Regional uh, Schools. So I will turn it over at this point in time to, is it is Asia, right? Asia. <laughs> Asia. Uh, Saron and Holly Johnson, who are both on, on with us. So... All right. It's all yours. Thank you guys for having us tonight. Um, as Ken said, my name is Asia Sarone and I co-chair the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. The law requires us to evaluate the special education system and advise the district on the safety and education of students with disabilities. Our organization has been an official CPAC for just over a year now, so this is our first ever annual report. Um, this year, has been a difficult year for everyone. We want to thank all the teachers, related service providers, instructional assistants, and administrators for going above and beyond for the students in this district. The flexibility and dedication they showed this year has been amazing and we are so appreciative of everything that everyone has done. This district did an exceptionally great job at providing in-person learning. And while IEP students benefit from this, they're still going to take longer to catch up due to their disabilities. So we hope that this will stay in the forefront during programming and budgeting decisions for years to come. We aren't sure exactly how long it will take, but knowing that it already takes kids a while to catch up from even a summer, losing a lot of time this past year is, is gonna take multiple years before we're seeing all that recouped. With the support from the special education department, we were able to hold our monthly meetings and workshops remotely via Zoom. We held informational webinars and provided caregivers opportunities to support each other and to network. We met with a variety of administrators to discuss COVID planning, elementary technology, elementary PD. We did IEPs and 504s at Frontier, and we did a lot of work with disability inclusion. Administrators, principals, staff, and school committee members have all attended our CPAC meetings throughout the year. While there are many wonderful things happening in this district, we are tasked with the responsibility to evaluate the special education programming. We went over the district's policies, procedures, state data, and got input from families. Through this process, we have found concerns with special education compliance, documentation, communication, and training to varying degrees throughout the district. We found that special education related policies and procedures were adequate. Um, the special education procedures manual was very difficult to find on the website though, so we would um, encourage changing that, making it a little more visible would be great. If families, staff, or community members feel that the school is not meeting legal requirements, they can file a complaint with DESE using the problem resolution system. PRS investigates claims and determines whether a school is in compliance or non-compliance of the law. Due to a mix-up and then a delay at PRS, we were unable to get the official data summarizing the total number of complaints from each school this year. So we had to rely on unofficial data from CPAC families and we had no reports of PRS complaints from Deerfield CPAC families um, that we spoke to. And perhaps there were other families that we didn't come into contact with, but of the ones that we were able to talk with, there was no concerns there. Families can also go to the Bureau of Special Education Appeals about concerns. The BSEA conducts due process hearings and renders rulings and decisions. 
while the BSEA doesn't keep data for specific schools within a district, um, as a whole, they received 11 notifications of rejected IEPs from our district in the past year. Concerns that were brought up numerous times were included um, in this report. So I'm gonna start with the district-wide concerns that families had and some of our recommendations, and then we'll get into more specifics about Deerfield later in the presentation. So overall, families love the special education teachers, IAs, and related service providers. They're all doing an amazing job. They foster personal relationships and really build a sense of community, which is a major strength for this district. However, families are concerned that staff are being overloaded with IEP paperwork, meetings, lengthy assessments, and filling in for other staff. They also have to do their teaching jobs on top of all of that. Families are worried that their beloved teachers are going to burn out and that there's also going to be some legal problems with missed services as a result of all this overload. Most local school districts, including Frontier, have a special education team leader that does the IEP paperwork, schedules meetings, and helps perform evaluations, but our elementary schools do not. This puts a great deal of additional responsibility on our principals and special education teachers. So we would recommend that the district looks into hiring a special education team leader at the elementary level. This new position will make our schools more attractive to highly qualified applicants and decrease the burnout risk for our current special education teachers. There are concerns with special with central offices documentation and adherence to legal timelines. The state and federal laws make it very clear what documentation is required and when it needs to be provided to caregivers, but we've had numerous violations of these laws from all the different schools um, and the frequency does vary by school, so we want to make that a point. This might sound like a minor paperwork issue, but these delays lead to months of missed services. IEPs are provided on a three-year cycle. The first year is a comprehensive evaluation and the school district has 45 school days to get the family the IEP. The following two years are updates without an evaluation and the school has 10 school days from the annual meeting to get the family the IEP. New services do not start until the family has received the IEP and signed it. CPAC parents across the district are reporting that it takes twice the typical time frame for each of these situations. If a 45 school day evaluation takes 90 days and the 10 school day period each of the two following years takes 20 days each, that child has now gone an extra 85 school days, which is approximately four months over a three year period without the updated support that they need. If a student is on an IEP their entire life, they would have five of these triennial IEP cycles, which would be 20 months or two school years of missed services due to paperwork delays when they're already behind all their peers due to their disability. We recommend that IEP meetings and paperwork get standardized and streamlined to ensure that the district is in legal compliance. In our district, IEPs are often written in vague terms, which makes it difficult for staff to follow the document. Unlike the general education students whose curriculum standards are determined by DESE, the IEP guides the curriculum standards for many students with disabilities. Having vague wording makes it difficult for teachers to know what should be taught and how to measure progress, which can lead to a subpar education. We feel it's important for all special education teachers, related service providers um, to get PD on IEP development, the timelines, and to be brought up to speed on the district special education procedures manual because we found that some were unaware that that even existed and they work for the district. Our special education department was not reporting rejected, partially rejected or unsigned IEPs to the state until midway through this school year. When schools report these to the state, the family gets information on their rights and possible next steps. When they're not reported to the state, Families do not receive this information and cannot make informed decisions about their child's education. Due to COVID, many IEP students were in remote only or sub-separate classrooms or just unable to stay in the classroom for the entire day. So we recommend professional development and training on managing behavioral issues for all staff, general education, special education, related service providers, and instructional assistants and that schools develop individual action plans to support high need students as we return to normal. The CPAC also recommends that the district wide 
anti-racism initiative continues to expand to include a variety of minority populations, including students with disabilities. And now onto the Deerfield specific information. So DES has 90 IEP students, which is approximately 29% of the student body. There are seven special education teachers, giving them a 13 to one IEP student to special ed teacher ratio. This was, um, the ratio is about in line with the district, but the um, percentage of the student body is higher than most. It was the second highest in the district. Families at DES specifically reported that their special education services were not always fully provided. As stated in our main report, we strongly recommend that the district hires a special education team leaders to take on the administrative duties so that the teachers can focus on teaching. We are also concerned with reports from families of repeated physical escorts, restraints, and exclusionary timeouts at Deerfield over the past three years. This was the only portion of our, of our report that we looked back three years instead of one because some families were in remote only situations or out of the classroom more often um, this year and at the end of last year. But they're still worried that upon returning to normal that this is going to be an issue again. So to avoid that possibility, we recommend professional development on the district's school restraint prevention and behavior supports procedures um, for all special ed, general ed, related service providers and instructional assistants. And this will be helpful for kids who may not even be identified as an IEP, but just due to COVID and all the stressors, they might be having a harder time. So I think it's just good practice all around. Um, there's a district policy on physical restraints, but there's no mention of physical escorts or exclusionary timeouts in that policy. So we would recommend that that get updated to include those. And the district procedure on physical restraints, um, the language isn't always consistent. So in some portions, it just says restraint, and in some says restraint, escort, or exclusionary timeout. And we would just recommend that you put all three just for clarity so that it's just clear cut for families, for teachers, everyone knows that we report certain things at certain times. We also recommend adding language about specific time frames to improve clarity and accountability of that procedure. So for example, it says that you're gonna notify parents, but when are you gonna notify parents? Like really explaining when that's going to happen so everybody's on the same page. And there, just like the other procedure manual, this one had poor visibility. It was hard to find on the district website. So we would recommend that the district just sends out a digital copy to parents and staff on a yearly basis so that it's easy to find if the situation ever arises for them. Are there any questions? I know that was a ton of information. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I, I I just have had a comment that um, I was very you know impressed with the the report and as I read through it uh, there's certainly a great deal of information for our administration and faculty and staff to to absorb and think about and try and uh, integrate all the suggestions that have been made. That's certainly. Uh, and I'm sure there will be priorities assigned to many of the things that you've, that you've pointed out, but it's certainly, I think, an incredible first year effort. I don't know how much time you folks put in on that com on the committee, but it's uh, a lot of work and a lot of information in, in the report. So um, I can't speak for the administration, but just from my perspective um, as a school committee member, it certainly provided me with a lot of information. Um, to, to think about and, and have conversations with them. So I don't know if Darius or Karen have, have anything to say or any of the other committee members, so. <clears throat> no, I, I'm just gonna agree with you, Ken. I, I thank the CPAC for the efforts they've put in and their ongoing communication um, and you know, received the report yesterday and looking over it, there's recommendations like you just said, uh, we could give priority to some of them. Um, and be able to report back. And uh, having read through it and listening to Asia uh, um, speak about it and share it with us tonight, if you have any questions going forward or anything that you would like me to speak to in other school committee meetings, I'm happy to address those questions um, and continue the conversation. Sure. Thank you. Uh, but uh, certainly I, I, I should add thanks to Asia and Holly for the amount of work and effort that you've put in and the communication this year has been um, outstanding. I, I mean, monthly 
monthly public comments and uh, good communication with, I think, administration and, and school committees and, and the general population. So thank you so much for your efforts uh, in this first year. That's quite a mission statement you have, by the way. <laughs> So thank you very much. We'll keep uh, chugging along and doing the best we can. Okay, and and thank you for uh, this good summary to start off our evening. So, anyone else out there? <clears throat> okay, well, thank you again, and uh, we're we're going to move along on our our agenda now. I think that uh, we'll give, as Karen mentions, the special education team a chance to to digest and uh, take a look at things over the, into the summer and uh, get in preparations for next year. So thanks again for an incredible first year of work and uh, look forward to hearing more from you. So, so the next item on our agenda would be to review and approve the minutes of April 14th, 2021. Um, Motion to approve. That's Carrie. Okay. I'll second that. And David with a second. Did anyone have any comments or edits or note any errors? Um, by the time I get done sending it to, to Donna, I, she usually catches most of the typos. So <laughs> we'll see. Um, hearing no comments, we will look conduct a roll call vote on the uh, minutes of April 14th, 2021. And uh, Ken Cunnaback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. <clears throat> um, Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. And Erica Jacob? Yes. Okay, so five zero. Your first vote, Erica, thank you. <laughs> Financial statement and uh, signing of warrants. Shelly, I assume? Yes, I'm here. Good evening. Uh, so I did, hi, I <laughs> sent you all the uh, expense reports today. I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Um, and we are at a point in the year where we look really closely at budget lines. Um, to see where we have overages or where we had savings. Um, for example, our transportation, uh, since we renegotiated our contract with school being primarily remote at the beginning of the year and only a certain number of students and we have savings there. So we look at all of those accounts and see what funds can be reallocated to other sources. Um, so we're currently in the process of doing that with my team and, you know, and Tina and, and really saying, okay, is everything encumbered? Are all the POs in the system? This budget is remaining. Are you going to spend it? Um, we're trying to wrap up our spending by the end of May so that we have a more realistic number of, of where the budget stands, which is a little bit earlier, I think, than in prior years. But my hope is um, that gives us plenty of time to, to take a deep look at it. Um, I'm also looking at uh, revolving funds and adjusting where necessary. So Deerfield for the most part has already made those adjustments. Uh, school committee will remember earlier this year, we moved um, school lunch wages onto the general fund budget um, and off of school lunch. And then I think we also did the same for almost all of the early childhood wages. So mm -hmm. there shouldn't be a lot of changes in that regard. Um, I will have a more thorough update for you on the revolving accounts for the June meeting. Um, it probably won't be final numbers because it takes us a little bit of time to work through those details, but I can at least give you really accurate year to date information and we'll have a good idea of what those accounts will look like um, as well as school choice. So I'm taking a look at those pieces as well. And then um, I just wanted to give you an update on COVID related grants. So whether it's state grants or um, the CARES Act funding from the town, uh, Deerfield has spent, I want to say around 300,000 on COVID related expenditures to date. We have a little bit of money left that Tina and I have worked out a plan for to spend through the end of this year. And then, as you know, we're going to be receiving that ESSER 2, which is going to help support next year's budget. And there's still talks of ESSER 3 funding um, going to help us out a couple more years. But that officially has not come across my desk yet from Desi. So I don't want to be premature with that. But 
um, it's been really helpful that there's been federal and state funding and even town local funding to help us out with all of the PPE and cleaning equipment and supplies and materials and HVAC and um, technology. I think Deerfield is probably uh, right now out of the elementary schools in the best shape as far as technology goes. I think we have all new interactive panels in the classrooms. The Chromebooks should be one to one at this point. So um, we were really fortunate this year to have that funding because this time last year, we had no idea <laughs> where we would be in a year. Um, so I'm thankful for the spot that we're in. Um, and then the warrant amount, I skipped over that at the beginning. I usually state that first. So you all signed 10 warrants electronically since last meeting, uh, totaling $133,143.95. That's all I got. Wow. That's certainly enough. Um, plenty of things. Uh, just a Quick, does it look like we're still in line with, with the projections that have been going on most of the year in terms of school choice impact and things like that? Yeah, I, I was looking at the school choice reports today. We should be good as far as revenue we're receiving. Um, Karen did send the final claim information with the special education increments that we're in, and Deerfield was going to be up a little bit, I think, because of that for school choice. Um, the Early Childhood Fund will have, my guess is less than 20,000 revolving. And then mm -hmm. the school lunch I wanna say is gonna have between 30 and 50,000. So, you know, I think those are numbers that we talked about earlier this year. Okay. And then the general fund budget, um, we do need to preserve, we had talked about saving $90,000 from this year's budget, reallocating to school choice so that we can support next year's budget. That's what helped bring our number down from the 7% to the 3.75 or 7.9 that we were at for next year. So all of that looks to be on track at this point. Okay, good. Um, thank you. You're welcome. I know that there's a um, <clears throat> capital planning committee and finance committee joint meeting going on right now as we speak. Uh, the budget at the town level is extremely tight. So they're taking a long, hard look at uh, the prioritized list at the Capital Planning Committee had provided. So we'll we'll wait and see uh, what impact that has. I, I think if there's any impact, it would most likely be at Frontiers level as opposed to Deerfield. So, um, but we'll find out. <clears throat> it's a fun budgeting year. <laughs> so, um, any questions or anything from the assembled multitudes? <laughs> Um, the next item on the agenda then would be public comment. I was not notified of any public comment, uh, so we can move on in the agenda um, to the next item, which would be a COVID update. Would that be Darius? I guess that's me. Um, <laughs> I see Jim, Jim Smith and Jillian, do either of you guys want a couple right. of comments? I just want to make sure anybody, nobody else is on that wanted a public comment. Oh. Sure. Sorry, Darius, they're joining me for my principal's report. Oh, whoopee. Okay. Well, whoopee. well that's nice. <laughs> COVID update, I don't have, um, you know, that's kind of a standing thing that we have this year. There hasn't been a whole lot of changes in, um, you know, what we're doing. We're kind of, we're back in the swing of things. And, um, you know, our, we've been doing pool testing weekly and um, for the most part, not getting negative results. The pool testing from yesterday came back negative. Um, and when we have in cases, uh, we're, you know, we're we're dealing with them, processing them, and um, and our, our you know our, it's, again, once again, our, our our procedures and such, and what's happening in the classrooms and such um, is working up to date. So, outside of that, I don't really have any other COVID and planning for next year. Um, you know, as I said, I think in the past meetings, the you know we're looking for a regular opening for next year, um, and we'll see where we are with vaccinations and that kind of stuff, and what the protocols are going to be around masks and any other kind of PPEs that'll be needed or procedures in the building. But every month is a little bit different than the month before. So I think we've learned don't over plan. Don't try to out plan COVID. Um, just, you know, take, it, you know, take the information you have in the month you're working on it. So um, yeah, we'll have, to do, we'll have to figure out what we'll be doing as a school committee if we'll need to have a meeting before school year starts in August, where usually we try to, you know, there's some months we take off and that kind of stuff. So we'll discuss that in June. 
but mm -hmm. that's my COVID. And is there, unless there's any questions regarding COVID or anything COVID related going on in the schools, I'd be happy to answer. Um, okay. um, I, oh, yeah, one last final thing. I did get a, a question from, I think I got it from Deerfield um, regarding, are we going to do anything regarding vaccinations for 12 and up? And for sixth graders, that would fall under some sixth graders, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm in the process of talking with um, our public, our board of health, and other health officials in the area, trying to do a vaccination program for 12 and over through the schools um, for convenience and that kind of um, thing. You know, talking with other superintendents, we don't always think about it that way. But there's there's an access issue when you live where we live to get to a place to get a vaccination and that kind of thing, and especially while school is going on and that kind of thing. So um, <clears throat> Amherst has been able to do something like that in their schools um, and for 18 year olds. And, and now they're gonna try to do for whatever. And I'm trying to copy that here so that we can have at least an option for families um, to get a vaccinations while at school. So we're, we're talking about it. However, it's, it's Pfizer only. And right now J and J is the only thing that Deerfield has been getting from the federal government. So. Um, you know, we're working out how can we get those things here, you know, so mm -hmm. working on it. Okay. Thank you, Darius. <clears throat> Anti-racism and equity subcommittee update. Would that be Kelsey? Yes, it would. Um, and I apologize. My camera on my personal laptop is not working and I forgot to grab a Chromebook on my way out. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, so... You know, it's we're kind of in that part of the year that's crazy for um, for teachers and everyone in the building. Um, so we are up at Frontier. We're about to have our first in-person discussion group. So we had been doing those virtual discussion groups um, since February. Um, so this will be our first in-person one tomorrow, actually. So we're excited to see how that goes, um, and we're excited to expand that model um, into the elementary schools next year, hopefully. So the kind of the last big thing this year, um, we will be having an all committee, a full committee meeting um, before the end of the school year um, to kind of clarify what the priorities are for next year. Um, so tonight I actually wanted to ask you all if you had any questions about the work that we've done this year um, or if you had any, any feedback or anything that you wanted to make sure was brought to the full committee as we're thinking about um, priorities and directions for next year. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, from my perspective, I, I think the work that the committee has done this year has been outstanding. Um, it, and again, we're in the first year, much as the CPAC committee was in their, their first year, but this is a, a you know, a new, a new initiative for our schools, um, a very important one. And I, I, you know, personally think that the work has gone pretty well I, and or very well. And, you know, we're getting good. I think you're getting good feedback um, across the spectrum of the community. And uh, hopefully that will continue and we can continue to build, uh, build on this year's experience. So. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Anyone? Yes. Um, I agree that um, overall it has been a positive response um, from the community and it's it's definitely been a positive response from students. They've been really um, eager to engage with this content, which has been really exciting. Mm -hmm. It's It will take time, as we all know. So, but it's a great first step. Anyone else? We need caffeine or something out there tonight. <laughs> a quiet crowd. Um, no, I, I want to thank Kelsey for uh, being a regular reporter at our group, uh, at our uh, committee meetings. But I also want to extend our thanks to the, over, the whole committee and the whole team that's been working on this. It's been a, an incredible effort and just uh, good communication to the school committee and good communication to the school community, I think, uh, that uh, needs to continue. And this is vital work. So uh, thank you for your efforts, Kelsey, and 
please pass along our thanks to the rest of the team. So I absolutely will. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, so well, this crowd is tough tonight. <clears throat> um, new it's business. Trevor talked. What's that? I know I Trevor's. Just realized there was a lot of filler. <laughs> just kidding. That's true. We will um, try to make up for it. I will. Under, yeah. under new business, I, um, I'll, I'll start the new business section by apologizing. I should have apologized at the beginning. I had sent out a note to the uh, committee members today thinking that we were doing reorganizing tonight after the uh, town elections, but we will be reorganizing at the June meeting. My apologies for jumping the gun on the, uh, the note to you all, but you can certainly think about positions or things that you'd like to do with the committee and uh, we'll have a good reorganization meeting at the start of the uh, June meeting. So uh, new business discussion, charging for early release Friday gap care. Tina, is this you? It's not. I was it's gonna not. say if it is, Darius is pulling a trick on me. <laughs> is it Tina's idea? No. No, um, I didn't know. <laughs> it's, I have some fun here. So uh, basically, uh, you know, what I'll do is I'm gonna present my screen um, just as, as my notes on this and it might be easier than just looking at me talk. Um, not that it really needs a, a presentation. Um, so basically, just kind of talking through this. Um, so going back, to, we're talking about the early, the, the professional development days that you know we approved in the, last, in the calendar last month. Um, there's this time period between 1.30 and 3, which we call the gap care time. Um, and when we rolled out the, um, when we rolled out those professional development days and go back way back to Marty Barrett, as you may, some of you may remember, um, it was this time, what are we going to do with the students? We're going to provide enrichment activities and that kind of thing. That really didn't take off the way we wanted to. Um, and also the amount of people that signed up for the gap care um, to stay till three o'clock because kids were having fun. There was a lot of recess, that kind of stuff um, made that even more difficult. Um, so that's a little bit of the history that kind of came through. And so during this time period right now, we are paying um, for people to watch the students between 1.30 and 3, um, but we're not charging. And so we would like to next year start off with a nominal, not start off, just have a one-time nominal fee, um, proposing a $5 child, $5 fee to cover that um, 1 to 3 o'clock. Um, the fee will be used to, you know, pay for the snacks that we'll be providing um, that part of the day, you know, kids are going to be hungry. Um, it also um, keep the child ratios low. and it's less than what I out of school time charges right now. It's, um, as it says right there, the fee for $5 for one and a half hours is below the six hours, $6 an hour that is typically charged by our school programs. Um, scholarships will be for families with financial hardship. We're not trying to push anybody away who can't afford it. Um, and we'll go through our normal out of school time scholarship um, qualification program for that. Um, and if people want to continue for the out of school time at three o'clock on those early release day, the um, the rate of fourteen fifty will apply for the time. So, and these are this is the calendar that was approved last month, and where there's early release days, um, there are twenty in total. Um, right now, students and teams will probably help me here. They sign up for some, you know, the thing. they sign up for some and not others. Um, the way it works right now, when they need it, or that kind of thing, depending on the time of year, what's going on in family situations. So. That's what we're looking to do. So I bring it to you for questions. Uh, Darius, you said a one-time fee, but it's $5 per Friday, correct? Per yeah, week. if I said that, I misspoke. Thank you. Okay. It's, it's $5 it's per, right. it's $5, it's a $5 per day for the hour and a half coverage. Okay. That, that was going to be my question. <clears throat> so um, any other questions from people or? I, Mary. Mary, do you have a number of how many? I know it varies uh, day to day, month to month, but how many students participate? Tina? 
Last year we had around 140 and upwards to 160. And so Darius is correct. Families are able to sign up monthly and some people choose certain days and some people don't. But on average, we have anywhere between 140 and 160. Wow. <laughs> That's a good sized group. <clears throat> so, um, okay. Well, if there are no other questions, um, this was just prevented, presented as information or would you like a, a vote? There I, is. I would like a vote. If the committee's not ready for a vote, we certainly, you can, I need to know by next year. Um, <laughs> yes, you have the month of June ahead of you still, you have a meeting, but. Um, well, let me see. Whatever. It's scheduled to vote tonight. Let me see if I can get a motion to uh, prove it. Can, can I just ask a quick question, Ken? Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Just, well, just specifically, so where does the money go? Is is there an, uh, is it for the out of school time budget? Directly Correct. to that budget. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that'll help <clears throat> offset the costs. You know, we're we're paying those people now without a charge, and we were picking it up, supplementing it from either. Um, if Shelly's still on, we know exactly where we're supplementing it from. If we're, I don't want, uh, if we're supplementing it from other, from the out-school time budget and the excesses they had. Um, so, you know, basically, you know, the rest of the program is paying for this gap care um, rather than us being able to use that money to offer, you know, additional things and, and or staffing. So, I mean, if, if my math is correct, we're looking at around seven or eight hundred dollars a day times 20 days is a fair amount of money um, that we would generate out of this. Do we have that kind of staff expense? Um, you know, on the order of, it, if my math is right, it's been a while, but isn't that around $16,000 or $15,000? Um, just a curiosity question. You're probably not gonna <laughs> Maybe I'm getting, what's that? We're probably not all going to pay the full five, so I would right. drop that down to probably a hundred. Or I mean, I don't know what the statistic would be, but probably a bit less. Mm -hmm. It's probably five hundred a day. Right. Even at that, it, it's you know ten thousand at five hundred a day. So right. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember last year. I think this was paid from budget, Tina. It was not paid from out of school time. Our instructional assistants are assigned to cover in classrooms, and we needed to use all of our instructional assistants for that gap time, if you will. We were able to free up maybe one or two to join some of the professional development. Right, but that, I mean, as as you just noted, that it takes the IAs out of the professional development picture, which isn't ideal at times, but I, I don't know how you, get, how you work around it. Um, there, there is, you know, to be transparent in this, there is the fact that when you charge even a nominal fee, many families will choose not to have free child care, gap care that they may may not need. Um, that they're leading their students in because mm -hmm. it's a free gap care time. And so therefore, you know, we're not again, you know, five dollars for an hour and a half, um, you know, you know, for several months out of the year is not it's not going to really push me away, but it does make people pause whether or not they right. want their child, whether or not they're going to come mm -hmm. at the regular missile time and pick up their kid. And the idea is will that will help reduce the number twofold. One, it will help us pay for some of the losses that we have there. Two, will allow us to free up some staffing that we've had to use for that. And so, you know, originally this is where something we went back and forth on. And I this is I know this because you know those of you done that were on the committee. Um, eight years ago, I think when we did this, no, longer than eight years ago, um, was it yeah, about eight years ago, that's not right, um, is when we kind of came out here and it was really trying to, we really wanted to get that professional model in place and try to, and we had a lot of, we had nice planning about creating, you know, enrichment activities and we'll do this. And then once we created some of those activities, everybody signed up for them. And all of a sudden we had capacity issues of trying to make that work. And mm -hmm. so that kind of all, and we, and meanwhile, we've seen the importance of the, I hope we've sold the importance of the, um, the PD and having the, the ongoing PD rather than at that time, there was only two days a year at the elementary school um, that were, were set for PD outside of parent conference and such. Um, mm -hmm. PD was, but it was very, very limited. So we've been able to get a lot done and really move that needle in, in, in supporting the teachers and such. So 
that's kind of the history there. So I just don't, you know, part of this movement of doing the five dollar fee is that you know, the families don't leave here. They don't just leave the students in. If you know they need to sign up um, for the after care program, and you know there's financial hardships, we will we will support them. Um, you know, so that's that's you know looking at that as well. Yeah, I mean, I I was just raising the question to ask the question. I wasn't <laughs> doing it as a a critique or anything. So, um, Erica, I see a hand up there. Erica, go ahead. Yes. Sorry, I was pressing the raise hand button instead of the mic mute button. Um, <laughs> I wasn't getting anywhere. Um, I just had a a, a question about. Um, I suppose a little bit of the origin of the early release day in, in terms of charging for it when, um, let's see if I can formulate this. The early release is uh, a time when the kids are being picked up or, or being released, obviously, early. Um, and for, um, I guess, is that how how long have we been doing the early release? I guess part of where I'm coming from with the question is about the idea of um, you know for uh, for par for dual working parent families and the fact of the um, you know having to figure out what to do with their children on an early release mm -hmm. day. So whether that's like part of a standard like is that something that uh, is that something that happens in most school districts i know it's a pro i know it's for professional development um and and it's got a lot of use use in terms of what happens for the uh, staff but i was just wondering in terms of um the school the set of the the school um day the length of the school day in terms of how it impacts families and whether that um because in, in some ways I was wondering if like the goal is entirely to, um, uh, uh, you know, are are we, there is, there is a little bit of a mention of, of being able to reduce the number of people who use it if they're deciding not to choose it. So I was just sort of wondering like how, uh, is, it, is it the school's responsibility to, um, have the full day covered for students who are used to having that full day covered. <laughs> Sorry, it's a kind of convoluted question, but I try to get a lot of angles at once, I think. Um, but if you can parse that out. That'd be <laughs> sure. So you, you did hit a lot of different angles. So one, the last where you ended is a philosophy question. What is the role of the school in a child care component of in you know of for for families you know what I mean you know do we have an obligation to families to provide child care 180 days out of the school year you know um, on full days that's a philosophy thing so I'm gonna say our job is to educate and provide the best education possible and in working within the constructs of our I guess that's what we're kind of saying here is that we need to create we can't create time for teachers we can't create more time so you know we created this model. The model started off with, I think, 25 days, and we reduced it down to 20 um, over the years. I think we did it immediately in the first or second year, so it was before I was in this position. Um, and so we did reduce it from there. Um, there are different models in different surrounding districts. Some do like half days, and they do one half day a month or half day in several months, you know, and doing longer time periods with the teachers. Um, we went with the reduce of the hour and a half on the Friday. Um, mm -hmm. Why did we pick Friday? We did survey the parents this year and overwhelmingly, they we were thinking about shipping it to Wednesday administratively, but overwhelmingly the parents were saying, if you're gonna do it, do it on Friday. So that's why we, we stayed with Friday. I think it was like 74% of parents said they preferred to have it on a Friday. Um, so yeah, so I mean, there's different ways of doing professional development. Do we have more by the hour than other districts around us? I think we're probably in the, maybe in the upper middle uh, of that. Um, I'm kind of guessing now, just talk, thinking of my colleagues and uh, other superintendents and other districts of what they do, but you're gonna see a lot of, a lot of districts, neighboring districts have a lot of half days, usually it's a half day Wednesday kind of deal, um, yeah. where, yeah. where they it's 11 30 or something like that, and they get three hours in or two and a half hours in, rather sure. than an hour. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that you bring up a good point that families will start to weigh the benefit of 
having their children in that time period when it becomes a budget issue for the parents as well as for the, you know, the benefits to the school if they get the revenue versus what the parents need to budget into their own to, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's a small, at least, you know, it's a cup of coffee or whatever, but not everybody goes to Starbucks every day, you know, so it's uh, the balance there. So anyway, yeah, it's <clears throat> something just to consider. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, Tina, sure. I think you mentioned uh, when, when it's a busy, you know, 140, 160 kids there, most of the IAs are there watching the kids. Is it, are we saying if, this is funded to this five dollars. Maybe there's fewer kids. Maybe there's more staffing from OSTP. Does that mean the IEs are then taking advantage of PD and that they otherwise are not able to because they're busy watching the kids? Yeah, I mean, given how many students sign up, then we would shuffle our resources accordingly and possibly be able to free up um, a, more IAs to participate in that PD. Right now we do a rotation, or last year I should say, it seems like it was so long ago, we do a rotation to ensure that um, every IA was allocated PD time. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thank you. I have a question. So can you, I just need a clarification on sort of what Carrie was asking as well. So the, the, um, people staff that you would be paying from that 130 to three are going to be people that would not be working during that time. It would be the out of school people that generally start at three o'clock. Darius, do you have ideas on this? Because um, <laughs> history is in EIAs. Some of them are, it's both. And we have a lot of IAs who also work in the after school program as well, uh -huh. right? So, you know, um, if we can now that we have if we have some more funds we can also have those who do just out of school time um to come earlier because we have funds now to pay for them so that would that would essentially open up additional slots will will we have enough for depending on the numbers let's say it reduces let's say it reduced by 20 kids or something like that we're still going to have an issue you know we're still going to have a staffing issue where we could bring in some but we're still going to use ias it's not going to we're not promising it's going to limit the use of all A's. It'll free up more in Tina's rotation instead of having four available to be part of professional development. Maybe there's six to eight that are available for professional development. Um, so, it's, but again, it's not the it's not the one. There's kind of all the pieces together. It's not the, there's no one reason. Like, this is why we're saying we're doing this. We're saying kind of you know cumulatively the the, the three different you know, different areas at, um, is why we feel there should be a, a charge there. And then could you just, I mean, I know the importance of professional development, certainly, but just give us a little idea of um, how that time is used um, to make, you know, to make a big, big picture type of difference. Because sometimes people think, well, an hour and a half is nothing. By the time you get started, it's over. So how do you formulate the, the programs for your professional development? Do you take, you know, one project and work on it all year how does that work i'm pulling up <clears throat> i'm okay I, I, I had my screen up so i didn't know if my mic was on good thing i didn't say anything um i'm going to present i'm going to present you really quickly when you when you talk about hopefully this is uh, um, Basically, this was this year's early release calendar, so that people can get an idea of what we're doing between the the 145 and the 315. Um, that's the teacher's time. The kids' time is is 1:30 to 3. Um, we're talking about the after school programs, but you can kind of see, you know, this year obviously our focus was anti-racism and professional development. You can see that ongoing. You talk about grade level meetings, and that's what you're talking about grade levels across the district. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at the health and wellness. So you, you're kind of seeing, if I if I had another, I, I grabbed the first one I could find. We have next year's in draft of what we're going to do. We haven't assigned them dates yet because it also depends on when our outside speakers are coming in and how we're lining that up. Um, but you Here, know, we, do you mind if I jump in for a second? Please do. Um, 
So Mary, they're broken up into categories. So we have a district proposed, like district times, and then we have building-based times and we have teacher proposal times. And so then we're able to dig deeper into each of those three categories. Great, thank you, that's helpful. And that was like the different colors in that thing, right? As well. <laughs> yes. So I see Erica with her hand up. Um, I just, it was sort of a follow up on that, which I think I have a better formulation of where I was trying to go with my question. Thank you, Mary, is you help and, and Carrie for your follow up too, because that helped. Um, is this idea of, um, I think with with uh, knowing that the, 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 the that, that the, that this, if we, if parents were given, um, were asked to to pay a charge for it, that also benefits um, this the students ultimately because the um, teachers are able to do uh, more professional development, or there's a shift that allows for more IAs to be able to do professional development. You know, like if it if it ends up being something. Uh, you know where it can be uh, presented to the parents, where it's like this is going to help ultimately help your your children because it's going to start a, it's going to free people, it's going to allow more to happen, um, mm -hmm. to benefit, you know the learning that the professional development to show how professional development directly. I mean, even though it may intuitively seem like oh yeah, of course that's going to help the teachers teach better or the IAs you know work uh, teach better. Um, maybe it's 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 one of these things where it's just making the case str um, more strongly so that the 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 sort of cause and effect it's like yes i'm i'm helping invest in the school so that my kids are getting a better experience mm -hmm. out of it i guess this is sure. one, one way of looking at it, so yeah it's true <clears throat> And you ask why now? Why are you doing this now, Darius? And probably the other thing. It's kind of so no matter what, anytime you charge parents, you're gonna it's gonna be it's not the most popular decision. People are gonna be like, Wow, well, oh great, they finally are gonna charge for that. You're not gonna get that, I don't think. But it is, you know, so we have a disruptive year. If we have a disruptor, I mean we didn't have after school program this year. So as we started back up, you know, if we're gonna do any major kind of changes programmatically, now's the time, at least in my, you know, we do transitions like that, it's the time to do it. And so that's why it's being brought up this year now as well so right. you know, wondering at the timing of it we've been talking about it administratively for years and we're kind of like you know it's a very not the most popular thing to do um and when's a good time to start doing it so kind of we have a reset of what the after school program looks like we've got a reset of what families have been doing with their own children and such so maybe they enjoy their, their kids so much this year remote that they want to pick them up early <laughs> Uh, has there been any consideration for sibling discounts? I mean, five dollars is not much for most families, but when you talk about two or three or four kids, it starts to add up. I'm just wondering if that's been discussed. It's not a deal breaker, but you know what? We have not ironed that out. Okay. So if you, you know, quite frankly, you are the first committee to have this discussion. You're the first May meeting, um, so I think we should look at that because I agree completely. Yeah. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> yes. Thanks. Good suggestion, we'll Carrie. We'll do that. Good one, Carrie. Good one, one kid. No, not the only one of three students out there. So maybe we hold off on voting until next month. <laughs> but I and, I, and I don't said, mind. If, I don't mind if you do. There's no. There's no kind of rush on this because we're not going to be notifying families till after June, anyways. And quite frankly, you can, you know. Uh, test the waters and conversations with people and stuff about how people feel about that, I guess. Mm -hmm. some, do some ground research. Sure, I think we put it back on the agenda for next month and um, maybe there will be a sibling discount structure to it, who knows? <laughs> but good suggestion, Gary. Any, any other thoughts, comments, suggestions before we move on? Okay, so no vote, no vote next month. <clears throat> um, we have uh, the next item on the agenda under new business would be to review the director of business administration's contract as negotiated. Um, Darius, do we want to move to executive session briefly? So I would recommend 
if I was chair, what I would do is if, if you guys are planning to go to executive session to talk about the contract, then I would do all the other business first. You have some guests on here, let them get out of here. Right. Oh, that's true. I'm, you're absolutely right. So why don't we move directly to the principal's report? <laughs> uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll go in, in a random order on uh, reports, but we'll start with the principal's report since we've got a couple people, guest stars here that are uh, going to help out. <laughs> So our first guest star is going to be Jillian Andrews. I know she has another um, appointment to get to, and she's going to be talking about our instructional leadership team. Take it away, Jillian. Hey, everyone. Erica, welcome. Um, so, you know, when it's really quiet, Ken, and you're like, wow, this is a tough crowd. Welcome to our world on a Monday morning. Particularly <laughs> with 12-year-olds. <laughs> Monday mornings are tough. It's like, yeah. Let's go outside. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the what's what we call is the ILT. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of what an ILT is and what they do. So I'll give you a brief synopsis. Um, there's a lot of lingo with teachers that school committee members might not be aware of. So um, an ILT is an instructional leadership team. And we have been, we formed about three years ago. We've been meeting for several years to help Mostly the, the goal is to help Deerfield improve teaching and learning through increased collaboration and distributive leadership so that it's not just on the administrators to be saying, you know, top down, here's what you do. It's really a distributive sort of um, um, method of looking at it. So there has been a lot of studies that show schools with strong instructional leadership teams are more effective at assessing the progress of teachers and students and then making adjustments as needed. So really, that's our main goal. Our main goal is to support teachers to focus on learning and growth. So the question is, how does an instructional leadership team measure learning and growth? And um, how do we as educators understand what our focus should be? So for example, should our focus be on um, having teachers work on a methodology of teaching like a jigsaw method or teaching them mnemonics? Or do we focus on response to intervention or collective teacher efficacy? So there are really literally thousands of different influences and um, the question for the instructional leadership team is how do we rank those influences and effect sizes that relate to student achievement? So luckily, we don't have to come up with that ranking <laughs> um, because we probably could never do it. Um, so the, the instructional leadership team is really examining evidence-based techniques, which has been, been verified from evidence to be effective. And the, the evidence that we use is based on meta studies of what actually works in education. And we've been studying the work from this person named John Hattie. He's very, very, he's high, highly regarded in the world of education across the world. Um, we're basically studying the work from um, this visible learning, which is the world's largest ever collection of evidence-based research into what actually works. So this year, the instructional leadership team had a, you know, we were we were sort of on a roll for a few years and then COVID hit and sort of um, just put the brakes on for us. I mean, we really had to reassess. Um, it sort of gave us a yellow light rather than that green light. So it's not that we stopped, but it really did. We, we really did need to pause and um, had to just think about how we were going to collect uh, information and where um, where our stakeholders are in terms of how the community is doing. So based on that, we wanted to take the temperature of how teachers, families, and really most importantly students um, are faring after this unprecedented year of remote and hybrid learning. So we did these surveys. This was back in um, February when we handed them out. So they were a little bit dated, but they gave us some important information. And I just wanted to just briefly share some of the um, the data that we collected, some just some summaries, and um, it really just helps us as a school gauge what we're doing effectively and what needs our attention, particularly after this year. 
So um, with the teacher survey, it's, it's interesting that we were just talking about that professional development. And Mary, you asked a really good question, like, what does that look like? And one of the things that we found was that educators um, are really connecting with students and families. Um, educators over the past year have been prioritizing supporting families. That's been a huge shift. Um, in terms of all of the roles and responsibilities that we do, there was this added um, this added responsibility to check in with, with families in a way that we haven't had to in the past. Um, one, of the, one of the things that educators found, which really ties into that professional development, was that um, many educators felt that what we really want is to have more time connecting with our colleagues in small groups. We've missed that. And along with that, educators showed an interest in receiving additional professional development and collaboration through what are called PLCs, another lingo, which stands for a professional learning community, and coaching. So there was sort of this, this new um, way of looking at our role as an instructional leadership team moving forward, knowing that, knowing that that's what teachers want. We're really trying to integrate that. And as Tina had said, there were those different categories of professional development, one of which is building based. And so um, that building based team collaboration is something that we're looking at as an instructional leadership team to see what are those um, goals, what are our goals to support teachers again, to focus on learning and growth and to have teachers working together based on what they think they need, which is professional development, um, some teachers wanted coaching and then these professional learning um, communities. So then we also did family surveys, which was interesting. Um, most families, the report was really positive. Um, I'd love to say that we received more feedback, but um, we did receive quite a bit. Um, quite positive. Families felt programming was appropriately rigorous. And don't forget, this was back in February. So um, this was still while a lot of students were still still remote. We certainly weren't back five days. Um, 62% of the parents surveyed did identify an academic barrier for their child. Um, we're, we haven't really, the survey did not iron out what those are necessarily and how much of that was a result of um, being at home and having remote learning. Um, and the other great news was family felt very, families feel very welcome and connected to the Deerfield community and that communication's been meaningful, effective, and helpful. Lastly, my favorite was the surveys um, given to students. And that's actually something that the instructional leadership team has been doing rather than just collecting data of what we think based on, um, based on anecdotal evidence or based on assessments or tests. We're really trying to have student voices become very visible to us. It's a shift in what we're thinking about, but this was sort of a first step towards really getting um, surveys from students so that we hear from them directly how we're doing. And students felt generally positive about remote learning on Wednesdays. Don't forget this was when um, many students were back in school in, in February at the beginning of the year. Many students, not surprisingly, struggled around technology, at home distractions, missing time from their peers. Um, students, this is maybe my favorite piece of data from everything we collected, students felt that they were learning a lot almost every day. Um, and again, that voice of, of students, what we think as teachers, you know, we can we can be wrong. So to have that voice of, of students is really key. Um, and students felt very supported in knowing that they could improve their learning. So some, some really meaningful data. Um, we are going to be conducting another follow-up student survey um, at the end of May. And so we'll report back to you on that also just to see the difference. Um, in terms of how students are faring who are back in school, how has that been for them, and then also how students are doing who are remote. Um, and we'll be collecting that data to really give us some information about where we're going to go um, next year. 
So lastly, just in terms of the instructional leadership team, we're really also just looking to grow professionally. There are four of us on the team right now. Um, it consists of Meg Shulda, um, Kristen Robinson, Tina Jem, and myself. And this summer we're pretty excited. Unfortunately, it's remote and we can't go to Hawaii or something for it, but we'll do it. There's a virtual 2021 annual visible learning conference um, that we're all pretty excited for. And we're gonna just, we're gonna be doing things like um, taking courses in how uncommon leadership teams solve common school problems, um, formative assessment in a brain compatible classroom. <laughs> I know, but this is what we get excited about. I'm like, this is my summer. I'm psyched. <laughs> I know my my um my kids think I'm pretty geekish, but we actually really are excited about it. So we just wanted to share that with you because the ILT has not presented to you really, and we wanted to just let you know what we've been doing and and where we're going, and happy to answer any any questions. Well, thank you for that overview. It's uh, it's great to hear of the work that's going on I, I was not aware of it so i appreciate the the summary um how how's the team formulated and i'll get to you in a second erica <laughs> um tina and jillian how how were the three of you, or the four of you how'd you come together well, quite honestly, we're the last people standing. <laughs> we we had a larger team and um, COVID hit. And so these are the last uh, people standing. But uh, typically we reach out to um, get a broader representation of the school and we look for volunteers. Uh, so we're hoping to build our team next year. But although we are a small team, as you can tell, we're pretty mighty. We, we just keep chugging along. <laughs> No, no, it's it sounds like a tremendous amount of energy. Erica, you had questions or comments? <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to say thank you for all of that information, Jillian. Um, and also it can completely relate to the geeking out part. That does sound like a lot of really interesting stuff that you're going to learn over the summer. Um, I was curious to know, you said that you were um, wishing that more families had uh, responded. And I just didn't know if you, if, if it's, if you can share the percentages of like uh, how many people responded and, yeah. and how many students responded, was it? Um, sure, I have that. Um, there were 52 responses from mm -hmm. teachers and for students, we received 158 responses and we expect we'll receive even more because when we do it again, we will be having Erica Parker, who is our tech person, give mm -hmm. the survey during their computer time. So we should have 100% mm -hmm. or close to 100% um, cool. response, which would be which will be great. The more we get, obviously, the better. And then families, we had, let me see. Um, families, it looks like, not sure here, sorry. I couldn't be. It says 52 responses for families also. Oh. Yeah. That's a sample size. It gives us a sample, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, Erica, you raised a good point earlier when you were talking about if parents know, if families know why this professional development is so important, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a really important part. And, and maybe that's something the ILT does is, mm -hmm. is really um, give families an idea of what kind of work we're doing so that they can be invested in it as well. Sure. Well, great. Great. Thank you. So. Thanks, Jillian. You're welcome. I have to run. I'm off to another meeting. Thanks, Jillian. Thank you. So I'm going to let Jen present and then I'm going to let you read the rest of my principal's report. So Jen's um, going to present on diversity leadership team. Uh, hello, everyone. Good to see everyone again. Good to see you, Erica, and thanks for the opportunity. I think um, it's really nice, actually, to be able to come in and share all the stuff that we're doing in schools and uh, be nice to continue because it's, it's a good way for you all to hear what is happening in our building. So I, I sort of wrote up a report of the diversity leadership team and what we've been doing. So I'll, I'll just read that uh, what I've written. 
Um, the diversity leadership team started in 2017. That's when I decided that the Deerfield Elementary School community needed to look more directly at the diversity in our school and talk openly about the voices who were not being heard in Deerfield. So together with Dr. Richardson, we sent out applications to the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students, asking them to join our diversity leadership team. That first year, we used our monthly meetings uh, in the school day to discuss whose stories were missing in our school and in our curriculum, and to choose actions to address those gaps. Actions such as at all school meetings, we made presentations about famous black people in history or women who have made changes in the world, and had a whole school celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which um, hadn't happened in the school for several years. We ended that first year with a small group of students who joined the Greenfield Pride Parade. With each subsequent year, we added more to the group and to our activities. Each spring, we've had third grade students apply to join the diversity leadership team. The students already in the DLT have chosen, choose the three to six new members each year. In our monthly meetings, we have tried to address different oppressed groups with, and teach our students about them. The DLT students created activities that they brought back to classrooms across the building. Students would do things such as read books out loud to pre-K through sixth grade classrooms, addressing race or gender identity, and then lead discussions with the classes. <clears throat> they brought art projects about skin color to younger classes and talked about racial identity, what makes skin different colors, and how it feels when people treat each other differently because of their skin color. Students talked about identity development, and then we created bulletin boards with identity portraits from every student at DES. There was a school-wide uh, contest to create a welcoming logo that would show that we are a school that values diversity and inclusion. And the winning sticker was placed on every door throughout the school. We gathered after school as well to talk about topics such as gender identity and bullying, and then decorated the school for our, for our pink shirt days. Our group attended, attending the Greenfield Pride Parades grew in number every year. This year, we got off to a slower start, of course, due to COVID, but we continued this group um, during after school clubs, which uh, has enabled us to have new students join in. We're about to celebrate our fourth annual pink shirt day tomorrow. Um, where conversations about gender identity have become easier and more normalized in our classes. Our school has been engaging in cu culturally responsive work for many years at DES. This is not a new curriculum that has begun this year, but DES teachers have been doing this work and teaching with a lens towards social justice for a long time. Teachers have been learning more so that they can help support conversations in classrooms, Students are learning more so the conversations can be deeper and lead to greater acceptance and understanding. Even administrators have been learning more along the way about what kinds of what kind of school we want and how we can support this work. Students on the diversity leadership team are really an inspiration to us all as they bravely step out into the community and go into the classrooms to help advance these conversations in our community for everyone to learn more. I hope that all of this work will go out into the community. Um, thinking about Kelsey's question about what we want for next year, I think by having community, community members, including yourself, learn more, um, we can ask better questions and we can all join in this work and be emboldened like the students uh, to continue our own growing and learning. Um, the pathways that were sent out about a month ago is one way to, for you to engage in this learning. We would love to have you join our school when events are happening and you're allowed to come back into the classroom when the diversity leadership team holds these events to come in and see what we're doing. And of course, asking any questions about the work as we share. So thank you for your time, and I would love to answer any questions you have about the diversity leadership team. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Can can I ask one favor? Could you send that statement? Sure. <laughs> to myself or to Donna, or one or the other, just so it can be included in the minutes. Yes. It's a very nice statement. Um, a tremendous effort. <clears throat> uh, Jennifer, and, I just want to say thank you for that report and thank you for the work in doing this. I'm really grateful as a parent and school committee member to uh, be have a school where the students and teachers are doing this work and good. It's going to make a difference. And there's a uh, a lot of schools in this country where this work is not happening. So glad we have, have one that does. Well, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome. <laughs> I, just gonna, I was just gonna add to that to say that, um, th you know, thank you. And also, um, what was I just gonna say? Sorry, it's leaving my brain. Um, you mentioned the, the leadership team as a smaller group. Is that different from the group that you also do for, how, how do they interact? Um, so normally um, in the normal year, there's a smaller group, the leadership team, and we meet on a monthly basis in the school during the school day. And they're the kids that kind of disseminate out into the classrooms and run projects, do read alouds, come up with activities, the after school club is open to anyone um, where we just do more educating about any of these topics and you know they support some of the activities, but they're not necessarily the kids that go into classrooms and do the teaching and talking and, and leading activities. So we'll get back to that next year, I hope. We just couldn't have kids going into other classrooms this year and all of that. So yeah. thanks for the clarification. Yes, thanks for the question. Uh, well, anyone else? I, I, I'll just say I'll just say thank you too. And also, I just think it's great. You, obviously, the, the the kids are kind of leading the charge here and leading this effort. It's uh, it must be really fun to also see that. Obviously, as a teacher, if it's as it takes off. Um, but I did have one just question as I was just at the end here. So you, are you teaching fourth grade? Yeah. And, and did you say that this is a fourth grade group? Um, fourth, fourth, fifth, fifth and sixth. It's fourth, fifth, and sixth. Yes. And then okay. in the spring, we um, invite the third graders to apply, and then they sort of get integrated in the last meeting or two. Got it. So next year, we'll have to kind of um, backpedal a little and shore right. up our group because we've lost a lot. Um, mm -hmm. so. Sorry, I, I missed the fifth and sixth joining. I was thinking how amazing it would be that you've got these fourth graders and how you manage that, like with the fifth and sixth graders not being involved and being told what to do and taught by fourth graders. But nah, sorry. No, they're they're actually really good. Even when fourth graders go into a sixth grade, I usually have a sixth grader with them, but they pair up to go and read or do an activity, and they're they're super respectful of each other, and they are they have great conversations, and you know the teachers really don't do a lot. They help more with the little ones to help facilitate, but sure. uh, the kids do an amazing job. So, so yeah, that's great. Fantastic. <clears throat> great work, Jennifer. Thank yeah. you. Um, you've had a busy year. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it's a passion. So I appreciate um, the kind of school and support to be able to do this work. Yeah. Well, we appreciate the work, believe me. Um, a part of the reason why I started doing this 30 years ago was because I, I believed in Deerfield Elementary as an educational leader in, in Western Massachusetts, if not across the state. And things like, uh, you know, the diversity leadership team, the uh, instructional leadership team, these types of initiatives aren't mandated, but what they provide for the town of Deerfield and for the Deerfield Elementary School just speaks volumes um, in terms of the level and quality of education in our school. So thank you so much. <clears throat> so, Tina, oh, we're going to read the rest of your report. That's yeah. good. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, yeah, so I sent it late. Sorry about that. <laughs> And it's just all the fun activities that are coming up. Just one th note, we are gonna have a hot air balloon here on Thursday afternoon, if anybody wants to stop by for that. Don't ask, 
We have great parents too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that should be interesting. <laughs> so that'll be fun. <clears throat> okay. I think that brings us to superintendent's report or, or Carrie, anything with the collaborative? Um, the uh, report was sent out oh, probably right. three or four weeks ago now. So yeah. I'd forgotten about it, but yeah, it went out. So that's the <laughs> <Okay>. report. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, Darius, you have anything? Um, I'm wrapping up this uh, day after tomorrow, my last uh, new superintendent induction program. So after three oh. years of that program, I'm finally ready to leave this district. <laughs> So, but no, it is. We're, we, Be you know, still my heart. Yeah, there you go. So I think that's the only thing that's not on the other stuff that we were dealing with. And Tina, make sure no one lets go of the rope without hot air balloon, please. With me in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Well, then I, I think we will move. Should we move to executive session? Darius. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're going to we're going to move to executive session uh, to discuss. Uh, I don't have the exact language here. Oh, it's in the uh, minutes. Um, for discussion of pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A, to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel, specifically Director of Business Administration. So we will be going into the meeting and we will be coming out to take a vote. Um, and I don't know if Shelly wants to stick around till we come out or not, but. Uh, or right. So. Uh you're basically, I'll be probably invited in with you, everybody else. Yes, we will be inviting Darius in. Um, if you need to invite Shelly in for an executive question, you can do that as well. But um, you, how we do this, Erica, I'll just say that a lot for everybody, is you're gonna completely leave this meeting and you were emailed the extension to the other meeting, the top secret link for an executive <laughs> question. And then we'll have to come back to this meeting after that. And so meanwhile on YouTube, it'll just be just my face. On that one. All right. I will jump off, and Darius, you can just text me if they want me to join for anything. Cool. Okay. That sounds yeah. good. Thanks, Great. Shelley. Thanks, so Shelley. <clears throat> All right. So we are. Uh, I need a motion to enter executive session. So moved. Second. Gary. David. Second. This is a roll call vote. Well, we're doing all roll call votes anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Um, Mary Raymond? Yes. <coughs> Carrie Edgels? Yes. And Erica Jacob? Yes. Okay, we are going to move to executive session. You should have a link to it. Does everybody have one before we sign off? Jennifer, you're going to sit and wait for us to come back in, or? <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so, everyone has the link. We'll yep. all leave. We'll all leave and move on over to executive session. Hey, David, you haven't left the other meeting. Oh. Uh,
Just had a nice news flash that Massachusetts had its first day in over a year with no COVID death. Wow. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Trending in the right direction, anyway. Yeah. How do we lose Ken? Now, just as I was hanging up, I did hear him sort of trailing off saying something about do we go back to the original one I got locked out before or something? I can, let's see, should I give him a buzz? You're muted, Ken. I see that. Uh, I said, always an adventure. My email went out, disappeared on me while we were gone. I had to go, and then it wouldn't start up. <laughs> so, okay, we are back in regular session, uh, returning from executive session at 6.35 p.m. And I will entertain a motion uh, re relative to the uh, contract for the Director of Business Administration. We want to make a motion to approve the contract as negotiated. I would make that motion. Second. And Mary seconds. And we will conduct a roll call vote. I'm assuming no um, additional conversation necessary. Uh, Ken Cutterback. Yes. David Sharp? Yes. <coughs> Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. And Erica Jacob? Yes. Very good. It is official. We have approved the new, newly negotiated contract for the Director of Business Administration. Darius, please extend our thanks and congratulations to Shelley. And uh, we look forward to working with her for the next five years at minimum. <laughs> so, so, yeah, just FYI, when I get all five approvals, um, then I'll have to have you sign up unless you're originally right. signing. Yep. John will figure it out. Sure, she will. So, uh, the l last order of business would be adjournment. Or did we ever do the minutes? Yes, we did the minutes. <laughs> so, um, and I forgot to do the executive session minutes in executive session, so we can save that for another executive session someday. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Let's see, second. And one more roll call vote. Thank you all for your time tonight. Uh, Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. And Erica Jacob? Yes. Very good. Thank you all, and we'll see you next month. <laughs>